You're listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Welcome to Habitat University. This podcast is your source for the science behind wildlife habitat management and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. We're your host, Jared Brook. And I'm Adam Janke, and we're both biologists and extension wildlife specialists. If you're interested in wildlife habitat management or looking for ways to improve your property for wildlife, this is the podcast for you. So join us as we talk with researchers, managers, and landowners all about the latest research and the ins and outs of wildlife habitat management. Welcome back to Habitat University. We are starting something exciting uh, for the next couple of episodes. We're going to build on what we just talked about in the last episode about how Aldo Leopold uh, suggested there were five tools that could be creatively used to restore wildlife populations that had, in his words, hitherto for destroyed it. And those tools are the cow, the plow, the ax, fire, and the gun. And what we're going to do for this is we're going to interview a specialist that has some expertise and perspectives on each one of those five topics uh, and bring those interviews to you as a way to kind of explore just a 10,000 foot view of um, how those tools are used today in habitat management and how historically they were used for good or for bad for wildlife habitat. So uh, each one of these episodes, one of us is going to do all the work and the other one's not going to do any work at all. And so in this instance, Jared did all the work. So Jared, uh, you were exploring fire for our first in the series. Uh, Tell us who you had on and what you did. Yeah, so I drew the short straw and I had to do the first interview. Um, And luckily, I didn't have to go far or search far to find the right guest for this episode. And that is Marcus Lashley or Dr. Marcus Lashley, um, who is the host of Fire University, which is one of the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University podcast network. And, you know, he hosts Fire University. He has a background in research on fire and using prescribed fire to create and enhance habitat for wildlife and he um has a passion about it he and i share the the pyromaniac passion but pyromaniac in a good way so it's a really fun interview we you know we also know each other we uh went to the same graduate school at the university of tennessee and at, in fact i uh found out during that episode that marx and i um, are descendants of Aldo leopold's um, academic prowess so if you look back at the lineage of graduate students that Aldo had and then who they went on to uh, influence, we, sh- we share some of those uh, same people that Aldo um, influenced. So pretty cool thing to learn. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm really excited to hear the episode and kind of think about how fire, both suppression and uh, application through prescribed fire can be used uh, as a tool and kind of what we've learned through time on fire management in North America. Yeah, and I, I certainly always learn something when I talk to Marcus. I learn some new terms and concepts, um, and Marcus thinks about fire very creatively, which is kind of the theme of this episode, and he thinks about it in ways that I know I wouldn't think about it, and a lot of people probably don't think about fire. Um, so it's a really uh, it was a really fun interview to do. Really good episode, and I hope people really enjoy it. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it for one. So without further ado, we're going to cut to that. But before we do that, we want to tell the listeners about a new thing that we're doing. We're looking for feedback uh, on the podcast. We'd like to hear what you think about the podcast, what you think we, what direction you think we should be going with the podcast. And also, if you're willing to share sort of how the podcast has um helped you think about wildlife habitat management in your job or in your spare time for recreation or on land that you own. So if you'd be willing, we would really appreciate 
uh, you completing our new listener survey and that a link to that listener survey is going to be in the show notes of this episode and every episode from here on out. It also really helps us if you can give us a rating and write a review on whatever podcast platform you find us on that helps others find the episode and also helps us justify to our bosses so we can keep having fun and doing wildlife habitat education on the podcast. So without that, I'm going to pass it off to Jared and Dr. Lashley and learn about fire. So fire is what we're talking about today. And there's no better person, in my opinion, to talk about prescribed fire as a habitat management tool than the host of Fire University itself, Dr. Marcus Lashley. So Marcus, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think that may have been a little bit generous. I don't know that I'm necessarily the best person to talk about it, but I may be one of the most enthusiastic people to talk hey, about it. For you're sure. available too, so you know, yeah, so we had to go yeah. with who was available. Well, that says something about it, right? <laughs> The fact that I have time to talk about it uh, may mean that I'm not the best person necessarily. <laughs> so. <laughs> hey, we're, we're fellow pyromaniacs. So. Oh, yeah. Another thing, I, I was kind of intrigued. I haven't heard your other episodes, but you immediately brought in Aldo Leopold. And a little fun fact, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're aware of this, but our academic lineage leads directly back to Aldo. That's pretty cool. I remember... Um remember discussing that when I was a master's student at University of Tennessee. So for those that don't know, Marcus and I share a um, master's advisor at the University of Tennessee, Dr. Craig Harper. So I'm an ancestor, so so to speak. That's right. So we are, uh, yeah, descendants of the academic prowess of Aldo Leopold. Yeah, we're four generations removed, I believe is what it is. That's pretty awesome. Hey, I learned something today, so there we go. We can just end here. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and that's all you need to know about fire. For those that aren't familiar with Deer University or Fire University, why don't you give us a little background about yourself, what you do, and, and sure. especially related to fire. Yeah, so I, I recently took a post at the University of Florida, and I, I'm an assistant professor there. So I've just started in the last, what, a little over a year now. And uh, before that, I was at Mississippi State University. I was really active with those guys with the MSU Deer Lab. And uh, my program has focused since I was in graduate school on fire and also other habitat manipulations, especially civil cultural practices and forests in combination with fire and how they affect wildlife. And of course, I grew up hunting and fishing and, and still am passionate about hunting and uh, I focus a lot on game species because of that. And I think uh, that's probably what most people who've heard of me know about me is that I talk about fire quite a bit and game species or, or I'm passionate about those. So uh, for our listeners, uh, if you've heard Dear University, there's a pretty good chance that you've heard me on that. I've, I've been on that show quite a few times and now I'm hosting Fire University, as you mentioned. And uh, the idea with that is to talk about fire ecology more holistically, not just about game species, but of course I bring it back to those quite a bit because I love, I love talking about game species and and fire ecology together. So yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, fire is such a, an, an underutilized tool, something that we need in many of our systems in the United States and around the world. And it's also such an effective tool when people start using it to manage habitat for game species. So I think it's pretty important. And I I definitely get fired up to use a pun about that topic really, really easily. So I'm glad to come talk about it some more. (laughs) Well, again, I I think you're the perfect person for it. Even if, even if you're the, if you were available or not, you're the perfect person for it. So there you go. Let's see. And I always think, uh, I always like talking about fire and I always talk about, you know, if we talk about the uh, habitat manager's toolbox, to me, fire is kind of like a Swiss army knife. There's Mm -hmm. so versatile, so many, you can do so many things with it, has a lot of different applications and different ecosystems. And we'll probably get into that more, but it's one of those things that you can just use in so many different ways. Yeah. And that's something that I find really interesting about it is it seems like it's just one thing, but 
you know, not all fires are created equal and we can really start manipulating lots of aspects of, of fires to accomplish different objectives on this. Again, I, I think that's probably what we'll get into more in this show, but uh, I, I'm really excited about thinking about those kinds of things. And, you know, another thing that I focus on a lot is trying to help people get into that same uh that same mentality, you know, it's, it seems like a really daunting tool to to uh, start using if you haven't been. So we can talk about that as well. How do you how do you uh, get to a place where you think you can use it effectively and safely? Absolutely. So before we travel down that road too far, I just kind of wanted to start maybe a little bit of history and how we got into these episodes was talking about Aldo Leopold's five tools of game management. He called them. And this idea, and we're going to read back the quote that we're going to kind of use to launch this episode and launch our discussion, mm -hmm. and then we'll kind of get right into the meat of it. But that quote is that the central thesis of game management is that game can be restored by the creative use of the same tools which have heretofore destroyed it. The axe, cow, plow, fire, and gun. So today we're talking about fire. So Marcus, what was... What do you think Aldo was talking about? What was going on in the world in 1933 um, that made Aldo write those words? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. It's something I talk about quite a bit in my classes when I'm talking to students because the historical perspective is really interesting to think about and uh, sad in some ways and really a success story in others. But uh, we were kind of in this I guess the, the era is called the era of exploitation where, you know, we, we, we go through the, this period in time in the Americas where we were thinking about wild game as an, an inexhaustible resource. So the, basically the idea was we have plenty of wildlife and natural resources, so many that we can, we can uh, harvest or take as much as we want and never exhaust it. And I think, you know, that, that led us down many paths, which ultimately have shaped our field today. But one of the things that, that I think Aldo was talking about is what he was seeing around him. A lot of resources were being depleted. Uh, you know, land conversion was happening. He was seeing some of our, uh, our species and systems degrade. And, and uh, he was really foretelling some of the things that we ultimately have seen happen. But he also was advocating that we could take a different approach to trying to conserve these resources in many of the same ways or with the same tools that we've used to degrade those systems and species populations. So I think that's kind of what he was, was talking about. I mean, the, the idea that white-tailed deer and wild turkey and you know uh, some of these species were once on the brink of being gone, it, it's pretty incredible to think about, especially in the South where I'm at, where deer populations are, are you know, booming in many cases. I mean, it wasn't like that, not that long ago. And that's kind of what Aldo, I think, was talking about. That's right. And you got, you hit it on the, the nail on the head there with, I think, what was going on in, in that time period. And talk to me a little bit specifically about fire. What was going on with fire in that, that era? What was, what was fire yeah, looking so, like on the landscape? Yeah, there, so then we were talking about you know, I talked about it in a, a little bit different context, but there were also these, these uh, over that same time period, there was this initial, I guess, a visceral reaction, right? We get a lot of great things from fire, and it's really useful to a lot of the ecosystem services that people are interested in, but we inherently also fear it. And I think that kind of drove us to this, you know, with our misunderstanding of how our ecosystems work, we had this pretty aggressive uh anti-fire movement where we had a really aggressive fire suppression going on pretty widespread and you know we were seeing many of our our fire dependent ecosystems suffer as a result and uh, we can still see the, those effects in some places but so uh, you know several decades where we had pretty aggressive fire suppression efforts you know and we just didn't understand really the role that fire played that critical role in so many systems that's interesting. So it, it's almost like a, a lack of fire may have been destroying habitat in, in a lot of cases. Yeah, there, you know, 
and I studied disturbance ecology in many forms. And the one that most people know me for is, you know, from the disturbance ecology standpoint is fire ecology. But uh, a lot of people, when we talk about a system like the uh, prairies, you know, the tall grass prairie, uh, open pine systems, uh, the, you know, the historical oak woodlands that were that were all across uh, some of the U.S. These systems had fire as a natural process. And when you think about what disturbance ecology, what you would actually call a disturbance, is, you know, you have some stable state and then a disturbance actually moves the system away from that state. So some disturbance ecologists would argue that fire is actually not the disturbance in a fire dependent system. It would be the opposite way around. The thing that moves it away from that stable state is removing fire. So the disturbance in that case is actually removal of fire, just like you said. It's hard to think about it that way, right? It's so obvious that when fire happens, it's a huge disturbance. But in a lot of our systems, it would actually be the opposite. The real thing that drives the system away from the plant community structure and the, the uh, wildlife community structure that we are valuing in that system is actually removing that, that, uh, that interaction with fire. Yeah. I guess when you've been d dependent on fire for thousands of years and you remove that, that's a, a big disturbance, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about lonely pine ecosystem or any prairie system without fire intact in that system, it moves ultimately to a different stable state and vegetation community. So without having that recurring fire happening, then, uh, you know, that is, that is ultimately by definition, the disturbance. That's an interest, interesting thought. I really hadn't thought of that before, but that's why I'm glad I brought you on. Uh, well, I'm good for one of those every once in a while. <laughs> what is it? The uh, blind hog finds an acorn every now and then. There you go. <laughs> And so you've, you've kind of already led me into where I wanted to go with this next and just kind of wanted you to talk about what is the relationship between fire and, and wildlife and creating and enhancing habitat for wildlife? Yeah, and I think that's a great question. And, you know, especially me and a lot of our listeners probably, and uh, certainly a lot of our constituents as extension specialists often think about fire as a tool to manage game, just like Aldo was talking about it. But it really goes deeper than that. You know, when we're talking about the structure of, of these ecosystems, an open pine system, if we look at the wildlife communities in those systems, and particularly at spe non-game species, I know, I know, we're not going to stay on non-game that long. But if you look at the species of conservation concerns, so things that aren't doing so well, a laundry list of them, I would even venture to guess the majority of them, need a recurring disturbance to maintain the kind of structure that you see in those open pine systems or, or oak woodlands or uh, these grassland systems. A large portion of our species that aren't doing very well need the con those kinds of conditions or structural characteristics of habitat. And uh, they, uh, they often are dependent on fire recurring to maintain that sort of structure in the community. So, you know, while fire can really be used in a lot of different applications for a lot of things, in general, the connection to many of our natural resources or the structural characteristics they maintained in the uh, plant communities and uh, setting back succession and you know so many of our wildlife species are dependent on that structure and that's really missing in a large portion of the landscape now compared to historical accounts at least yeah so when we talk about using fire we're really talking about and using fire to create habitat and enhance habitat for wildlife we're talking about using it as a disturbance and managing plant communities right and a lot of those fire dependent plant communities sure and uh, I know I can think of some examples from up here in the Midwest and Northeast, and I'm sure that you can think of lots of examples in the Southeast of mm -hmm. those type, types of species, game and, and non-game species. Sure. Well, uh, just to, for, for those who are trying to visualize what I'm talking about here, we've recently put a video on, on uh, social media. I think it was uh, Bronson and I were on a video together, but we were trying to make this point and, uh, you know, I think based on the comments, a lot of people received the point well. When you're 
using FAR as a tool to manage resources like for deer. There are a lot of people who are really interested in using FAR to manage habitat quality for deer, trying to improve quality, improve forage production, fawning cover, those sorts of things. When you're doing those kinds of things, it really has a huge benefit over some of the other practices that you might use to benefit deer, like food pots or, or uh, things like that, right? Now we, we have this practice that is improving their habitat, but simultaneously casting a broad net. And we had a video just talking about a stand that we were specifically managing, an open pine stand that we were sp specifically managing for deer to try to maximize productivity for deer. And we had, we literally were getting interrupted constantly by Northern Bobwhites in the stand. They were singing in the back and it compelled us to record a video about managing for deer has now had this net effect on on other species and we kind of use bob white as one of those those uh canaries in the coal mine so to speak right they're, they're a good indicator for a lot of those species of conservation concern and here we were trying to record a video on deer and can't do it because we get interrupted so much by quail so that's kind of the point right we're this this uh, use of this tool can have broad sweeping positive effects on many wildlife species, even though you may be using it for some specific objective, you know, it, in many of our fire dependent systems in particular, you're going to have a big positive impact on many species. And I, that's one of the things I really love about it is it is really malleable to suit different objectives, but you often are having a really big positive in, impact on a lot of species at the same time. Hey, I'll, I'll get taken. Uh, I'll take uh, getting interrupted by Bob White any day. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a sweet tone. Yeah, go call. look at that video. I mean, it Bron it 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 was a uh, all Bronson could do to let me talk about quail for a minute because he you know he really likes his deer, but uh, they were interrupting us so constantly we we felt compelled. So for our listeners, if you're interested in seeing what an open pine system looks like and the structure that we're talking about that's maintained by fire and thinking about that from not only from a deer habitat but several species game species and non-game that that video shows you a great uh view of that structure and you get to listen to some bob white singing there you go can't beat that yeah so you let's let's take that idea a little further so you you hit on a little bit on forage quality and you hit on structure. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that from a habitat standpoint that, and I know this is going to give, I'm probably going to get the biologist answer of it depends, but what are the, <laughs> what depends. are the things? I'm going to stop you there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what are the things, some of the things that fire can help us with from a habitat standpoint? So you hit on forage quality and, and you talked a little bit about structure. So what, what all are we looking at? Yeah. Um, it depends. I'm just kidding. Let's get a little more specific I on that. that. Yeah. Well, you know, when we're talking about habitat management or wildlife management, managing forages, all those sorts of things, we're talking about managing plants, right? Not really directly talking about managing the animals in this, this scenario. They're just a byproduct, right? So when you're thinking about using fire, we're talking about manipulating the structure in the plant community. And sometimes the composition, depending on what your objective is and what, uh, how, how you're using the practice. So that's the idea is that we're using fire broadly to affect the plant community structure and uh, the composition to benefit a specific objective. And when you're doing that, you could have you could have lots of of uh, different ways that you're improving that depending on the species of context and what their specific habitat requirements are. I did listen to your episode on habitat. Uh, we can bring Good. up a couple of things I might want to caveat with it, but we'll, we'll <laughs> hey, uh, leave it at that. We're open to it. <laughs> yeah, you, you're one of our listeners. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, depending on the species that you're targeting and the habitat requirements of that species, you might be affecting plant community structure and composition in different ways to accomplish those needs. But in general, some of the things that I've focused on is, uh, one, forage quality. So we've known this qu quite a long time. Actually, uh, I have an episode talking about fire and grazing and that interaction and how that could be used to uh, affect plant community structure in a desirable way for other species and prairie. 
So uh, when we when we burn a plant community, a large portion of the plants in a fire dependent community are really well adapted to respond to that. So we have these plants in the system that often have really developed root systems. They're perennial plants. You burn in that system and a lot of them even have adaptations to make sure fire successfully moves through the system. So you have these plants that are perennial. You top kill them with fire. So basically fire burns off the top down to the soil layer and you have this intact live root system that responds to that. And when that happens, they invest a lot of resources into the, the above ground growth, right? So you think about, let's say you're a tree, right? It, a tree that gets top killed by fire has now a, a root system with reserves in it. And its primary mission now is to get back in a canopy position where it can capture sunlight because it needs sunlight for food, right? To generate food through photosynthesis. So it invests a large portion of its resources into growing really fast. And when that happens, it actually will mobilize nutrients into the above ground tissue and it essentially concentrates them in that tissue. So not only is young, tender, succulent growth, I mean, we all know that, right? You don't go and, and uh, pick out of your garden the, the uh, old mature leaves off of lettuce or anything, right? We want that young, tender, succulent growth the same thing is true with plants. We want that tender succulent growth, but something that happens when you top kill it with fire and you have this mismatch between the root system and the above ground growth and that need to grow really fast, that actually super concentrates nutrients in the leaf tissue and you end up with the, the, the young tender growth itself is higher quality than other young tender growth. So that's pretty cool interaction It happens with grass and with woody plants in particular. So perennial plants that have a really well-developed uh, root system like that. Because of that, super attractive, super high quality for herbivores and you end up with this magnet effect. So for six or eight, 10 week period, you'll have this really strong nutrient pulse in the vegetation that's really attractive for herbivores. And uh, in African savannas, for instance, there's been a lot of studies, and I think there was recently some stuff even with bison here, where they were showing this, what they call, it's called a grazing lawn, the grazing lawn hypothesis. So the idea is you have fire initiates this grazing lawn, and what I mean by that is you have this, this giant herbivore, you know, that often, like with bison, there'll be quite a few in a group, right? They kind of follow fire. They go and munch down on it and they continually crop the plant back down to the ground level, that new growth. And it sort of initiates this circular thing where uh, as you know, fire top kills the plant, makes it high quality, herbivore chumps the plant down, which generates more high quality and it sort of feeds back on itself to continually provide this really high quality forage. And uh, we, we use that concept in uh, managing cattle even in uh, many parts of the world, but uh, that's one thing that, that really can be beneficial is, is that, you know, the re release of nutrients and the way that you're changing plants and the way they respond from a forage quality standpoint is really useful uh, when you're managing for, for a lot of species, but herbivores in particular, if you're interested in deer, you know, that, that's really gr a great uh, byproduct of fire is that, that short-term resource pulse. So, that, that's one way that you might use fire. And uh, one reason that you might want if you have a property and you have the ability to break it into many fire blocks where you can have some patches burned in every single year, that's kind of a short term response that you'd be looking for and the reason you'd want to have fire each year. So if we move a little beyond that, we could also look at the plant community structure. This is something that you're probably much more familiar with than I am thinking about like from a point of view of a bob white if we start you know if we're in prairie or even in uh, some of these open these open forest systems we can use fire to promote native warm season grasses and uh, native forbs that together make a really unique situation structurally in the understory and what I'm talking about is you end up with a lot of bare ground where you have these grasses originating from a clump. They sort of grow up and you have bare ground underneath them around it. And then you mix that in with some of our forbs, especially 
most of our native forbs have a self pruning of leaves. So they have a, a little stalk that don't have any leaves on them. You mix those two things in together and you end up with this canopy in the understory. It's a canopy for a quail, not for us. But uh, you end up with a canopy that really protects them from overhead predation, but is also highly productive for, for insects and fruits and seeds and things like that that they eat. And uh, really creates a situation that's conducive to, to uh, foraging for that species and nesting. And uh, that, that's something that, that is really difficult to accomplish if you don't have fire involved, or at least it's difficult to keep in a location perpetually, right? We have to have that, that uh, disturbance coming back over and over. Yeah, I think that's that sh- the structure point's a, a good point. That's probably not as, maybe in, in a lot of cases, not as intuitive as other um, benefits of fire. But sure, from a bobwhite standpoint, you think about, uh, there being litter all over the ground in a prairie or in a grassland or in a pine savanna, and mm-hmm. that litter is almost creating a shield of armor on the ground. It's it's covering the ground, mm-hmm. um, which is not allowing you know those little quail chicks or little quail that are about the size between a softball and a baseball that they're using their claws to dig through the that litter to get to insects and get to seed. If we can use fire to get rid of that litter, we've just mm-hmm like you said, improved foraging uh, mm-hmm. for those individuals and made it a lot easier for them to pick those insects and seeds yeah. right up off the ground. Um, right. We yeah, also so you... created space for new plants to germinate by mm-hmm. removing that that layer of armor. Yeah, you're exactly right. And if you go a little bit further down, so we talked about the forage quality aspect for the plant quality for herbivores, but The other thing that happens is when you remove that leaf layer that you're talking about, you start exposing seeds and make them really easy to find. They stick out, right? You also have have uh, heated those seeds. I'm not sure, you know what what that does to digestibility, but I know that I really love roasted peanuts and pecans and stuff like that. So uh, there may be even some nutritional value. Who knows? I think that's something that we should definitely be looking into. But it certainly is attractive. And uh, in my experience, when wildlife are super attractive to things like that related to fire, it often ends up it's because it's such a, a big benefit uh, to their one of their habitat components. So I think that's a real benefit. I, I have some uh, photos. I don't even know how many hundreds of photos like this where I've burned in, in a uh, prairie or an old field or something, and there will be blackberry, cooked blackberry fruits laying all over the ground and the wildlife in there munching on them. So I know I love cooked blackberry. That's that's probably one of my favorite reasons to burn in uh, July and August up here yeah. in Indiana in, the, in some of our prairies is you get those nice around. cooked blackberries and it's almost yeah. like it's like you can close your eyes and taste blackberry like hot blackberry cobbler. <laughs> yeah, yep. Well, maybe Wait, we should it, be picking those up and it enhanced and, uh, my foraging some... for sure. Yeah, I'm walking around in there picking them up off the ground eating them myself. Yeah, so I, I love seeing like things like that. And a lot of my research program has kind of been focusing on some of these more short-term ephemeral things because we don't, that we don't think about those as much or we haven't historically and from a research standpoint. And that have, having chicks or having access to that things by chicks, whether it be quail or turkeys, you know, that, that easy access to seeds and fruit that are laying around, they've all uh, been heat, you know, exposed to heat the blackberries actually fall off the plant, which makes them accessible. I mean, there are a lot of things like that where we just, we know they're probably important, but we haven't studied how, how much that plays a role. And it could, you know, what it ultimately probably means is that it's really important to have fire on the ground year after year. You know, not necessarily if, you, if you're going to burn on a three-year or five-year rotation, you don't want to just burn all of it on the same year. You want to have some fire recent fire from each year and uh, I think that's a really important message and something that I've been focusing a lot on here lately another thing you you kind of alluded to it and I think it's a good segue for us to talk about some other aspects of fire that you could manipulate from a wildlife habitat standpoint is we we often burn during the dormant season especially you know really peaks in March in this part of the world as we have and, the same thing here in Indiana as well. Yeah. I, in fact, well, I, did a, I did a survey of uh, fire practitioners a couple of years ago, and 
I think overwhelming 70 to 80 percent of our fires Mm -hmm. were in in uh, March and April yeah and I I have a lot of stuff coming that where we're we're gathering data and writing it up and publishing it and we'll be sharing it through fire university and uh you know social media and everything else trying to get the word out but we've been looking at well, a couple of things. One is if you look at the distributions of, of fires being lit, just, you know, you just mapped out how many fires are lit each month for the entire U.S. Or you can pick a state. You can do name whichever one you want. It doesn't matter. Or uh, you can pick a county if you had enough data. It always ends up in this bell-shaped curve that's centered on March, which there's plenty of reasons that that is. But if you actually look at what lightning sets when lightning sets fire and looked at that same bell-shaped curve it would be offset from march up the center of that distribution that bell-shaped curve would be in june and that's if you're looking at it from the entire u.s standpoint so we've offset these two curves quite a bit and i started getting interested in that what does that timing offset actually matter and when you're thinking about some of these things it could like, for instance, when you're talking about the blackberries, if you burn in March, they're not going to be blackberries in most places in the U.S., at least. They're not going to be blackberries to fall off the plants, right? Uh, the insects that are, that are around, very different communities, right? So there are lots of reasons uh, that that could matter. The other thing is, if you think about northern bobwhite nesting during June, now we have fire coinciding with that. So we might think of that as negative. But then you have to think also, why do quail nest then? So here's my take home on that. If you were burning during nesting, yes, yeah, sure, you're going to burn up a nest or two. Uh, the research suggests that you actually don't impact nests that much, but you can. It makes sense. But what we don't think about is the fact that you also laid out a smorgasbord of seeds and, and fruits for those adults and also I tell people this a lot and I'm going to bring it up again. If you're, you know, a one inch tall chick, it is way easier to catch an insect that is dead than it is to run around and grab one that's on a plant somewhere. Right. And it doesn't, if you're that tall, it doesn't take that much of a vegetation response before you have reasonable cover. And uh, I want to talk about this much more with some of the folks that are studying turkeys and quail, but Another thing that I've observed in in my studies is when you burn at that time, every single animal that has a brood is in that fire. They all are foraging there. So, you know, there are reasons to think that some of our old ways of thinking about some of these things may not carry as much weight as we think they do. It may be more important to diversify and make sure that that animals have access to all of their habitat components, their structure, nesting, cover, uh, foraging opportunity, all of those things, you know, the, the arrangement of those resources. And you can manipulate the timing of fire in, uh, both at the yearly scale and, and uh, during the year, the seasonality, and uh, p- potentially really enhance the I guess the uh, juxtaposition of those resources together. And I think that's pretty important, something that we really should be thinking about more often. You know, really it's, it's about getting fire on the ground first to accomplish your objectives. And then we we start understanding that we can use fire in a variety of ways to to affect all these resources and, and really maximize those things. Lastly, if we're talking about timing, we one thing we've seen, and, and I think some of your studies have, have uh, probably shown this. I know that uh, Craig has done a fair amount of work and there are other researchers working on things with the timing of fire and looking at especially adjusting to a later growing season can really quickly and effectively shift plant community composition toward desirable plants. And, uh, you know, that's a longer term benefit that you could have by just changing the timing slightly you know, uh, you could really have a long-term benefit by shifting plant community composition. Yeah, we, we've, that's something I've been interested in ever since I got to Purdue and got and have been in my position even before that is, you know, I think the, uh, the common recommendation that a lot of landowners get from a burning standpoint, especially burning fields is, and native grass plantings is, you know, burn March and April. That's kind of been the, 
a general recommendation. And, um, you know, I, so I was interested in seeing, well, what, what if we change that? What happens? And so we did some burning, we've done burning in July and August and September, all the way through October. And, and some of these, uh, older native grass plantings that you may associate with like the conservation reserve program that may have been planted to some of these tall native grasses where they've just become so dominant and rank that they're only native grasses. And in one field in particular that we did this in, we burned, we burned half of it in August. And then the next March we burned the other half and then compared the vegetation in that field, the, that first growing season and, we saw a 40% increase in the amount of forbs in that field just from one September or one August or September fire. So a, a pretty immediate uh, change in the composition of the field. So I think you, know, you hit it now on the head that you can, you can change the composition. You can really change quickly. the structure. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it has a long-term lasting effect. Yeah. And that, we can get into the ecology of these systems, which I find extremely fascinating, but just, just a short thing. A lot of our native forbs are really well adapted to a fire that occurred then. You remember, we just talked about lightning season. That distribution was centered in the summer. We also used to have all these gigantic herbivores running around like bison that are basically a, a you know, they're, they're aiding primarily grasses in the system they're running around on four shovels if you have never seen the shape of a, a bison hoof you should go look that up and uh you know they're churning up the soil what do we do when we want to decrease the dominance of grass in a in a field we'd run we'd disc right that's very similar to what a bison running around would have done and that probably occurred right after fire because there was a magnet effect and they were initiating this this uh you know this intense attraction to that area so we not only are they intensely attracted to the grass that's re-sprouting but they're also churning up the soil benefiting forbs and a lot of our native plants grew up with that so to speak right that, that that's the disturbance that they are accustomed to and they respond really well to it that's right so and, and... i, I want to run around after fire with like a sheep's foot you know implement on the back of the tractor and run that over it and see how that responds but that's just that's something that I'm looking into. <laughs> so I think you made some really good points there about um, adding in some diversity to your fire, to your your firing regime and, and things on your property. You know, thinking about mm -hmm. frequency, thinking about size of the burn unit, which is a big one, and then also thinking about seasonality. So you're getting yeah. you're getting really creative there with uh, your use of fire. And so yeah. I'm going to use this as a as a perfect transitioning point to what I think is one of the most important words in, in that Aldo Leopold quote is that word creative, right? So mm -hmm. we got to use these tools creatively to sure. enhance and create habitat for wildlife species. So you, you talked about a lot of different creative ways to use fire. Now let's take that yeah. and run with it. And, and what kind of specific examples can you give of how fire has been used creatively to, uh, enhance or create habitat for maybe a certain wildlife species that you're interested in? Yeah, I think there are lots of things. And before I have some examples of things that are going on right now that I think are really, really creative and I'm biased because they're things that are happening in my research program. But uh, I, I want for the listeners, this is a take home point. Get you something to write on right now. I'll give you a second. I got, I got my pen and paper. There, yeah. So there, there is absolutely nothing wrong with burning in March or February or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're thinking that is the only time that you can burn, you are, first of all, limiting your burn days. Second of all, you are lim limiting the objectives that you can target specifically with it. Now, you can have lots of benefits from that. And if that's the only way you can burn, then by all means. But you know, if you're trying to enhance the use of fire and use it creatively to maximize your objectives and, you know, accomplish many different things, having a diversity and allowing that diversity to occur across years and within the year is pretty important. So if you don't get anything out of this, other than that, there's nothing wrong with burning at that time, but you are limiting yourself from the things you can accomplish and uh, how much burning overall you can accomplish 
if you are thinking in that one track. So lots that, of good burn that days in August and September and July. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I live in Florida. It's not really that fun carrying around a drip torch during July, but there's some good that can come of it if you can find a good burn day. And, uh, you, yeah, you might you might uh, be able to accomplish some things that you can't necessarily otherwise. If nothing else, you're you're just ha you're uh, listing more burn days that you have an opportunity to put fire on the ground, which is pretty important because in general we're not getting enough on the ground, and that's one major complaint is we don't have enough burn days and personnel to do it. So that could be really helpful. As far as creativity, there's a couple. Of, I mean, there are lots of people doing really creative things with fire. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I'm gonna focus on some of the ones I'm intimate with because they're in my research program going on right now. One of the things that I've been really interested in is this idea that fire and herbivory are interacting with one another and that there's a feedback there, right? And uh, I've kind of taken that idea and ran with it in a couple of ways and I've had a couple of graduate students that have done work and some of the really interesting things about that work that, that I think were really creative is that if you change the timing of fire, not you, you, you can directly damage plants and they have a, a different capacity to regenerate to that. So in other words, if you had a red maple, right? Red maples are, are invading or, or a sugar maple or whatever maple is dominant wherever you're at, uh, you can change the timing of fire to be more effective at controlling that directly. So you directly top kill a plant and it has less capacity to respond. Generally later in the growing season is better than, than early in the growing season, which is better than in the dormant season for controlling or outright killing those species. But what I got interested about is not only does that plant or those plants have to respond directly to being top killed, but it's also moved it's ve the vegetation from that, this re-sprouting, it's now moved into the range of herbivore and it's also becomes extremely highly attractive. So if you start thinking about the biology of the herbivore in the system and when it really intensively needs some resources and then start matching the timing of fire up with those needs of the herbivore, now we can intensify the role of herbivory in that system. And the thing that I've, I found really fascinating is if you, look at the way the like uh, for white-tailed deer with lactation and uh, the intense need for nutrition the attraction to burned areas is much higher when that fire has occurred or coincided with that that nutritional demand and not only that we also have a differential capacity of the plants in the community so like red maple versus an oak versus a forb you know you can insert whatever species you want. They have a different capacity to deal with fire and respond to it differently. So effectively, what we've been able to do in some of this research is change the timing at pretty small scales and direct the herbivore to eat the plants that we want to when they're most vulnerable. And uh, some of the really cool stuff that we're coming out with now is showing even when we manipulate that timing to get the herbivore like to eat the red maple that we don't want in the community we can get the herbivore to essentially limit the regeneration of those plants and then lay off of the things like some of the really high quality forbs they'll completely just stop eating them and you'll end up with this really diverse community of some of these other plants because you've just slightly manipulated the timing so I think that's really cool. I know that probably is a little more in depth than we should have gone. And uh, we can talk on and on. It may have been uh, a little more than some of these people wanted to listen to. But the idea that, to me, that you could manipulate timing and indirectly affect what community of plants are there because we've changed which plants deer prefer is pretty cool to me. And a really creative way that we can manipulate plant communities by feeding our deer. So I really love that idea. Another one, I'll try to make this one a lot less, uh, what it was, sciencey, <laughs> ecologyist. Uh, another student that I have working on some stuff right now that I, to me is kind of mind blowing is, you know, we have fire happen, and for that six, eight, ten, twelve week period after it, we have a super intense attraction to all these different plant uh, animals in the community. A lot of those animals are actually eating seeds 
outside of the burned unit from other places on the property. So those blackberries that are on the plant somewhere else that so think about, you know, X bird or whatever, you burn and then all of those species are attracted into that burned area. And what we've been finding is they actually end up directing all the plants, these fruiting plants from all the surrounding community that are eating fruits, they're eating whatever's available in the environment. They're actually directing them into the burned area. And we're seeing some suggestion that that's a pretty strong influence on what, how the plant community responds. So essentially the wildlife are bringing the habitat with them. We can start doing things like manipulating the timing of fire to manipulate which plants they direct in based on whether or not blackberries fruiting or pokeberry or whatever. You know, we could start manipulating that timing to direct certain plants into the community. And I, to me, that's something we've been working on a lot. And I just find that so fascinating that wildlife are part of the response, right? They are actually driving the responses to the practices we're using to manage them. And to me, that's really exciting and probably too sciencey uh, for some of the, the listeners. But the main thing is this, you know, this is a complex system we're trying to manage and fire pretty broadly can posit positively affect a lot of those resources when used tactfully. Yeah, no one uh, can say that you haven't thought creatively about this, Marcus. That's for sure. <laughs> You, you probably thought about this creatively well, I, in I'll ways that people wouldn't. So that's awesome. Yeah. Well, and I, I tend to get fascinated about things that other people don't. Well, we'll just leave it there. Other people don't find fascinating that I do. So well, I think those are yeah. some perfect examples of, of thinking creatively about the use of fire. And, and so, you know, we've covered a lot of ground here, Marcus, and I think we're definitely going to have to have you on for multiple more episodes to chase some of these rabbits a little farther, but, you know, broadly, we talked a lot about how fire can be used fire fire is used to manage the plant community, mm -hmm. both the structure and the composition, which in turn obviously impacts the cover and the food that various wildlife species need. And sure. you know, hopefully there's a lot of really good information that uh, people can take from here. But I think one of the big things is, you know, if I'm a landowner that owns 40 acres and, you know, I have some fields and some woods and, I'm really interested in, in trying to figure out how fire fits on my property to meet my objectives. What, where do I start? What's the first thing that I need to be thinking about or resources that I need to, um, need to look into? The first thing you need to think about is listening to Habitat University, <laughs> the Natural Resource University Network. And, and Fire uh, University, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's part of the network. Uh, yeah, we, and we will have some episodes targeting this specific issue with people who do this with private landowners all the time. And uh, this is common feedback we get is, you know, there's a barrier there, right? If you, ha if you haven't been using fire, it's hard to understand where to get resources and how to get into doing that. And I, I understand that as well as anybody else. And uh, I, I think there are lots of resources available to everyone. So you probably have a local prescribed fire council, for instance, you probably have a fire exchange. There, there are opportunities through those kinds of organizations to get information about how to use fire, what the appropriate methods to get training and, uh, you know, where, to, what kind of permitting do you need from a legal standpoint, all of those things are available to you locally, wherever you are. We have the Southern Fire Exchange here, very active. Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, organizations like that promoting good information about fire and a lot of organizations like prescribed uh, burn associations or prescribed fire councils that are about linking people not only to that information, but to each other to collaborate on accomplishing fire. I think that's one of the, the important things is don't think that you have to do all this alone. There are people who consult, there are state agencies, extension specialists who specialize in, in using this tool and they can help you get started until you get comfortable using it on your own. Or you may just want to, to hire someone to do it. You know, there are plenty of people that will never feel comfortable using it on their own and, and that's perfectly fine. So uh, even, even when you're going that route, it's still arguably more cost effective than some of the other things that a lot of landowners do. So uh, it can be a cost-effective tool still, but uh, there are plenty of resources like that available 
to to you there specific locally and even uh, opportunities to collaborate with other people who are burning. So like prescribed burn association where you have a, a collection of landowners that are using fire and you can share resources and knowledge and help that way. And also uh, through some of these organizations that have a mission to help private landowners use this tool. Yeah, up here in the Midwest, most of our states have uh, at least a state prescribed fire council. We have the Indiana prescribed mm -hmm. fire council here in Indiana. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any prescribed burn associations yet, but our neighbor mm -hmm. to the West, Illinois, mm -hmm. they have um, prescribed burn associations. And like you said, great place to start a lot, a yeah. lot of the, uh, you know, obviously there's thoughts about liability and, and things like that, that may be barriers to landowners, but another big one is equipment. And those prescribed yeah. burn associations, they share equipment, they share manpower. Yeah, and there, there's, and there's also opportunities for when you when you uh, collectively go after things together like that. There's opportunities even for like grant funding to help offset the cost of some of these resources that you may need when you can organize like that. And there's a lot of benefit from from that. Uh, I'm actually working with with a few other fire scientists and uh, some of the organizations to try to uh, develop some resources to teach people how to develop a prescribed burn association and what models are really effective to try to help with that problem, to get those more widespread. You know, in the states where they are, they've been really successful. And, uh, you know, they, there's room to expand that because I think it's really helpful for people like you're talking about. Uh, we have an upcoming episode on Fire University talking about the role of collaboration and some of these resources. And we have one upcoming where we're going to talk specifically about those landowners who want to use fire but haven't figured out quite how to enter this, you know, this, uh, the use of this tool yet. Awesome, Marcus. I think that's a, a, be a perfect resource for people who listen to this, this episode, and then we'll push them right there to that episode of Fire University. And it's like a yeah, we're nice all, package. We're right? all part of the network, right? Or they can yeah. just listen That's to Natural idea. Resources University and, and maybe they'll just, they'll just come up right next to each other as episodes. Yeah. You know, you never know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's that's the point, right? That was our mission with this is so that we could all collaborate to try to bring good information that's all interrelated, you know, uh, to landowners and, and uh, professionals in our field. So hopefully that we can do that effectively. And I, I certainly am trying to do that on my end to link people with the kind of information they need to use some of these practices and, and uh, hear you guys doing the same thing. So. Well, we appreciate you joining us, Marcus. Is there uh, anything... Any last words you want to say before we hop off here and let you get back to your day? Uh, set some stuff on fire. <laughs> responsibly, right? <laughs> Le legally, yeah, and responsibly. <laughs> cool, great. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Hopefully now you have a better idea of one of Aldo's five tools, which is fire, and how you can think about using it creatively to meet your habitat management objectives for whatever species you're interested in. Now, I, we're going to continue with this theme and we're going to go and we're going to talk about the other four tools that Otto Leopold talked about his in his 1933 book, Game Management. So stay tuned and, and listen for those. And we hope you join us for the next episodes. Habitat University is hosted by Purdue Extension and Iowa State University Extension and Outreach and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. The network is supported by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you liked Habitat University, subscribe and listen to the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. Iowa State University and Purdue University are equal opportunity, equal access, and affirmative action institutions. Natural Resources University is funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. New episodes are released every Tuesday. For more information, follow us on our social media platforms at nr underscore university. Mm -hmm.